Welcome to The Third Story. I'm your host, Leo Sidrin. Shana Tova, Happy New Year if you're doing that sort of thing. If you are gathering with your family, dipping the apples in the honey, telling the stories and laughing at the jokes. Of course, even if you're not doing that sort of thing, I think today's conversation could be of some interest to you. Last week, I talked to Peter Himmelman. He said something to me that I've been chewing on, I've been chomping on, I've been thinking about all week. He said, when you're Jewish, even if you're not observant, no matter what you're doing, whether or not you're observing or you're not observing, whether or not you're secular or you're uh, religious, and any level in between, you're doing Jewish. You're dealing with it. Even by avoiding dealing with it, you're dealing with it. What one might perceive as a passive activity is actually an action. Doing nothing is really something. I'm not saying that you're doing nothing if, if, or that I'm doing nothing, but I am saying this. You know, for those of us, such as myself, who have essentially been self-defined as culturally Jewish, that is not particularly religious, but still with a sense of identity, of a kind of cultural literacy that is Jewish, comedy and entertainment have been at the center of the conversation in the United States for a long time. Hollywood and the record business and much of what we consider to be contemporary American entertainment was really fostered by the Jewish contribution. Jews who came to the United States largely at the beginning of the 20th century within a generation had set up shop and started to weave their story into the fabric of the American story. So I was particularly excited to discover recently Jeremy Dauber's book, Jewish Comedy, A Serious History. I devoured the book and promptly reached out to him to see if we could talk, and that is what led me to the hallowed halls of Columbia University a couple of weeks ago on a crisp late summer afternoon to talk to Jeremy about his book and his thoughts on the subject. The book came out in 2017, and it's true that the world is a vastly and fastly changing place. And even in the space of a couple of years, there are some some things that have changed or evolved slightly since the book was published, and they're worth considering. And Jeremy and I talk about that. However, for the most part, the book takes a very long view. Jeremy's essential thesis is that although we may perceive the Jewish contribution to American humor, American comedy as a particularly modern phenomenon, it's actually connected to a long narrative, a long story that, as he tells it, goes all the way back to the Hebrew Bible. We uh, unpack that question and uh, various other uh, subtleties and nuances in the conversation, and it was a real pleasure to go up to Columbia and meet Professor Dauber. Before I get started with the conversation, you know this. You know this. Third-Story.com is the place to go for all things Third Story Podcast. That's uh, where you find the archive. Connect with me. Say hello. Get in touch. Click on the social links, and when your appetite has been thoroughly whetted and you want to savor more deeply, you want to sink your teeth into it, you want to engage it on a deeper level, you want to feel that you have contributed, that's when you visit patreon.com slash third story podcast. Put your money where your mouth is. Start the new year. 5780, I believe we're in, with an auspicious donation to the Third Story Podcast. Why not? Without further ado, here's my conversation with Professor Jeremy Dauber. Jeremy Dauber, I'm sitting with the man who literally wrote the book on Jewish <laughs> comedy. Do you think there's a difference between humor and comedy? Is there a distinction between Jewish humor and Jewish comedy? That's a great question. I think that it's mostly in the choice that an after-dinner speaker uses. Mm -hmm. The short answer is no, but we have time on the pocket. Sure. Humor is sort of this subjective phrasing of kind of a warm glow of kind of happy sensibility, and comedy is something that makes you laugh. Uh -huh. But one of the, uh, the things that I, that I took pains to point out in the book, but also when I teach classes, is to say that a lot of what we're going to do and a lot of what we're going to talk about isn't necessarily designed to elicit real laughter. Mm -hmm. um, that, 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 that My ambit was broader than that. And I think what, when we talk about a lot of this stuff, we're, we're talking about something which is broader than that. So that's maybe a useful distinction in the way that we think about the funny stuff that's before us rather than uh, you know any sort of meaningful aesthetic documentation. Did you feel that you needed to have a good sense of humor in order to embark on this or a good appreciation of what is funny? 
I hoped that I did, um, but you know that's often not for the individual to judge. Um, you know, I I think that what made me happy was that uh, when I would go through a wide variety of stuff and I said, well, this is something that really sort of strikes my attention and I want to talk about, you know, you would often subsequently find this corroboration where other people would say, oh, you know, that was my favorite episode too, or I really thought that was something very interesting, or of all the short stories, this was the one that I, found. but, you know, with people who I thought had good senses of humor. So I'm immodest enough to pretend to be modest and to say that uh, I'm not going to judge my own sense of humor. Sure. Well, I mean, it's an interesting question, right? Because funny is so subjective. Yeah. And yet there are sort of larger themes that obviously, you know, you don't have to think every f joke is funny in order to appreciate a larger narrative. That's right. And, you know, I always say this again to my students that, you know, you always do whenever you look at any of these things, you have to look at selection bias because you can't talk about everything. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, this is certainly going to reflect, uh, you know, a particular person's set of choices and set of interests. That said, you know, being able to rely on the work of other scholars and other critics is very useful to say, well, you know, maybe this is something that people are talking about. Maybe I didn't see it, or maybe I, I wasn't uh, giving it enough attention, maybe I should come back and take sort of a closer look at it. Uh, and I think that, that you know, that, so it's useful to have those checks sure. as well. Well, I, I actually I want to talk about the selection bias of the particular selector, it, it, in this case, <laughs> which, who is you. Yeah. Because, you know, my, and I think a very common relationship with the sort of story of Jewish comedy is a very American story. Yeah. And... You know, if you were a kid growing up in the late 20th century, I'm a little bit younger than you, but I have a sense that our popular cultural references were pr pr probably pretty common. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us had those. Yeah. You have also, though, a, a deep and personal relationship with Yiddish theater, with the sort of Jewish comedic happenings before they came to the States. Yeah, and I think part of that, you're right, is personal and biographical in the sense that I grew up as a, as a modern Orthodox Jew. Uh, and as a result, I had sort of a very deep interest, investment, exposure to uh, a wide swath of Jewish literature that uh, went back all the way to the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. And for me, it was very important, both in the book and in my sort of thinking about this, is to say, you know, Everything even that is of American Jewish literature is just the, the latest link of American Jewish comedy mm -hmm. in a long story that goes all the way back uh, uh, many thousands of years and that actually you can find real continuities and themes uh, and that that also allows us to have a surprising perhaps perspective on that Jewish past, mm -hmm. um, that it's not simply sort of uh, sepia toned, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people like, oh, but they, they, they had senses of humor too. They had sort of a good vulgar sense sometimes of, uh, you know, all of these different things. So that to me was, I think, uh, very much came out of uh, my own personal background. Yes. Uh, Right, and you chose over and over to sort of return to to the the past and chapter by chapter, and then sort of update the the story. That's that's right, and and you know part of that was uh, a joint sort of decision by uh, the editor, my agent, myself, which was a, I think it, it was a very smart decision on their part or suggestion um, to say you know you don't want to just tell this story chronologically because a lot of the people who are interested in this story they don't want to wait till page 276 to get to you know uh, Jerry Seinfeld right. or Larry David um, and, and, and so how can we do this and I, I really felt that um, you could tell a story about Jewish comedy that starts with this book of Esther, mm -hmm. um, this biblical book of Esther, which is the first kind of sustained comic, tragicomic, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it, treatment of Jewish life in the diaspora, which has been sort of a catalyst of all of this Jewish comedy, and that every kind of Jewish humor comes out of the book of Esther in a certain kind of way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for many centuries, maybe not as much for a certain Jewish population now, but for almost all of Jewish life, um, the book of Esther and its sort of outgrowths was a very regular part of Jewish life. It was the, the, the centerpiece of the holiday of Purim where Jews would celebrate and make merriment and mirth and have comedy up till in almost every Jewish community a couple of decades ago, maybe. Yes. No, and in the book you make a point of kind of saying that maybe Purim was the the birthplace of, Ju of, of Jewish theater, of Yiddish theater, dressing up as men, dressing up as women, that there was a kind of a direct line to that. 
I think that's absolutely right. I mean, uh, even if I said it, um, <laughs> I, I, I think uh, you know the, the sense that every culture, uh, you know, traditional culture, has a certain kind of period of, sa- of of letting off steam. Yeah. And Purim was that period, and and so there was this ability for mirth and license mm-hmm. and foolery mm-hmm. uh, in a way that you didn't have uh, necessarily in other parts of the year, particularly to allow for a kind of pushing back against religious or theological kind of uh, approaches. You know, the kinds of blasphemies you could say on Purim, you uh-huh. wouldn't be able to get away with necessarily in other places, right. other and, times. And Purim sort of uh, over time tran- transmutes to Friday night uh, at, at the theater. I mean, at a certain point, it becomes more commonplace. I think that's right. You know, in the, in the, in the late 19th century, you know, you begin to have uh, a theater that's not Jewish theater and Yiddish language theater that's not around the holiday, the, the, yeah. the time of Purim as well. And that becomes first semi-professionalized and then really fully professionalized. Uh, and it becomes, a, and, you know, and then uh, after even a little while after that, you have people who say, well, I don't observe the Sabbath. Uh, and so I can, I, I can go for a Friday night to the theater. Uh, and it could be even a, a Yiddish theater where everybody involved is Jewish. And nonetheless, it's, a, you right. know, it's not religious, paying attention to religious scripture. It's being Jewish without being religious. That's right. That's right. You know, despite all of the beautifully laid out arguments about where the sort of American Jewish humor that we recognize kind of comes from, I still find it to be much less funny to me until it gets to America. I mean, and I think part of that is my lack of real familiarity with why these things would be funny outside of the American context. But it does strike me that there is some kind of alchemy that takes place when the Jews bringing all of that history with them come to the States. I think part of that, uh, I'll say that I agree and disagree. Yeah. I mean, I think part of that is our all of our biases as people who live in a present that's sure. much closer to that and in a, in a place in a time. Uh, I find it, a lot of it funnier as well. Um, I think that probably, you know, when I'm, uh, I'm the other hat that I wear here, at times I teach uh, Aristophanes mm-hmm. um, in the great books curriculum. And Aristophanes is not funny, right? I mean, if you just read the text, right? You know, I mean, you could make it funny by, um, but, uh, you know, we all say things like, well, I'm sure at the time the ancient Greeks found this funny. And I I think that is also true for all of us of a lot of Eastern European Jewish life. And that's part of the difficulty of sort of writing this story. So I agree with you 100%. The the part that I think is true is that we feel much more deeply in our bones both the pull of a kind of mainstream American co- uh, culture mm-hmm. and the ways in which comedians kind of, and spe- specifically Jewish comedians, negotiate around that culture uh, in order to find the humor at its margins of belonging and not belonging. Yes. And we all come to it uh, in our own kind of different ways, but we feel that still profoundly sort of as a group. Yes. Uh, well, it seems like so much of the the humor and the point of view before America, and even in the early days of the, Jew, the Jewish migration to the States, was about being outside, about being an outsider. Yeah. But Jews helped really create American popular culture. So there's no longer that distance that we kind of relied on for so long. Well, you know, it's interesting because, it, you know, for many of the, for many days, yeah. there was and there wasn't because yes. Jews created this po- yes. popular culture. They created it in a way of saying, well, we have to masquerade, we yes. have to disguise ourselves, we, we can be ourselves and not ourselves at the same time. What do you call it? Peekaboo Judaism. Peekaboo, yes, that's yes. right. I, that's how I call it in the book, uh, Peekaboo Judaism. And, and I think that, that that does something which both generates the kind of anxiousness to please that that is so essential to comedy but also makes you feel that you're not fully comfortable which is fine for comedy because comedians can't be fully comfortable otherwise it's not uh you know and at the same time what what i found very interesting is that you know you have these 21st century uh individuals people like seth rogan or judd Mm -hmm. apatow Mm -hmm. or abby jacobson or alana glazer who kind of say you know here we are you know, we are not necessarily uh, Jewishly observant. We're not traditionally observant. We don't necessarily have the Jewish community as our main point of communal reference. Um, but at the same time, there is something that we feel that's deeply Jewish, and somehow we feel this is part of our comedy, and we have to kind of figure out what it is, which is, I think, why Adam Sandler always has these chuppas in his romantic comedies, uh-huh. right? You know, there's something there that still has to be kind of negotiated. Sure. Some examples that you give in the book of of this middle period of being an insider and an outsider in which Jews were able to really 
reach two audiences at the same time. A character, for example, I can't remember what show it is, who says, oy vey, whatever that means. Right, right, so right. So it's right. sort of like, if you know what, what this is, it's for you, but you don't have to necessarily know to appreciate it. That's right. You know, where Groucho Marx says at the end of a river he happens, well, did someone call me Schnorrer? You know, most of the audience who's watching these has no idea what he's talking yes. about. And there are a number of people who laugh hysterically, yes. you know. And I think, you know, for me, I found this just as a biography. You know, I'm writing now a biography of Mel Brooks. Ah, and, you know, I remember watching Blazing Saddles as a kid, and I did not grow up speaking Yiddish or learning Yiddish as a kid. Uh -huh. And, you know, so I understood that Brooks was speaking Yiddish in this role where he plays this Native American, yes. you know, he speaks Yiddish. But I didn't know what he was saying. Yes. And then, you know, 15 or 20 years later, I came back to the movie, and I was like, oh, these are words. This is a language this that I understand. Words. This is actually words. And I think that, you know, in the first time I was much more like, you know, it was a huge hit, Blazing Saddles, yeah. of course, uh, like most of the audience, you know, who sort of know and don't know at the same time. Well, I think that I am basically was raised Reformed Jew. We have a very complex relationship with Yiddish and Jewish tradition in general because we, I, at least I personally feel that it's meaningful and it, it means something to me, but it's to to also totally unfamiliar to me. Right. So, and it's like, as you said, Abby Jacobs, Jacobson is a good example of that. The, these kind of modern Jews who know that they're Jewish and they have a Jewish point of view, but they don't really know what part of them is Jewish. Right. And as a result, I think in many cases, I'm not going to speak about you, right? But, but, but we just met. But in many cases, there's a certain kind of sharpening of the symbolic point that therefore something like Yiddish becomes, yes. right? If you asked an Eastern European Jew who grew up, what does Yiddish mean to you? It would be asking, like, what does English mean to us, yes. right? It doesn't. It means everything and nothing at the yes. same time. But for those of us, and I still include, uh, maybe not as much anymore, but, you know, people who didn't grow up with Yiddish, you know, it can be, oh, it's a funny language or it's a nostalgic language yes. or it's a sacred language, right, if you're a Holocaust, the yeah. Holocaust survivor. But uh, that is, as a result, as you're saying, of this sort of uh, complicated relationship of, of, of ownership and loss. Yes. Do you think that, being an uh, Orthodox, being raised Orthodox, being raised religious, having that relationship with Judaism colored, affected the way you saw Jews in popular culture as you were growing up? Yeah, I think, I think so. I mean, I, uh, I think that, you know, having a, a religious background I mean, was, was to say you, you understood yourself to be in a minority in a certain kind of way, and that the majority of America was not doing what you were doing. Yes. Right? You were you were doing something different on Saturdays. You were wearing something, in my case, you were wearing something on your head. You were different in a, in a number of ways. And so it wasn't so surprising that re you weren't represented mm -hmm. uh, on, on, on these screens, right? And if you were, it wasn't so surprising that you were being represented in a way that was sh sharply symbolic of something, right? Mm -hmm. If the Jew appeared or the... And, and, and that was... So that wasn't surprising. And I think that that was a very different perspective on Jewish representation yes. in popular culture. You were a minority of a minority in and the it, sense that yeah. there were plenty of Jews that you could see. Jerry Seinfeld was on TV. Right. But he wasn't the same kind of Jew in a lot of ways. I think that's right. I think that's, I think that's right. And, you know, it, um, there was always the sense, or very frequently I should say the sense, that, uh, you know, any kind of Jew who wore a kippah or something, you know, it wasn't quite portrayed quite right on on, yes. on the screen. They didn't, you know, whoever was didn't really know exactly what was going well, on. Well, whoever, I mean, it was probably Jews. Sometimes, you know, and, and one of the things I actually point out in, you know, in, in, in classes is that all of this stuff is collaborative. Yeah. Right? I mean, all of it, when, when we're talking about these yeah. things, all of it's collaborative, all of it's writer's rooms. And, sure. And, 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 you know, what have you. So... You know, you never really know who's doing who's doing what, ex except in a very specific individual circumstances. But uh, but I think you're right that in a lot of cases, you know, and, and I think people are getting a lot better, and I think this is great of all sorts of things in popular culture about saying we want to really talk to people yeah. um, from different sort of walks of life, whether it be religious or eth ethnic yeah. or what have you, to say. Let's just do a check about this. You know, I come from the academic background where we always try and get peer reviews from experts. Yes. So, I mean, I think that's great that people are beginning to say, well, you know, X group wouldn't do Y, you know, or something. Right. Like that. Are you still religious? Uh, yes. I mean, we, uh, I say we because we have, have a family now. Yes. We, we observe the Sabbath. Yeah. We keep kosher. Yeah. And, and I have to say, sort of in the, 
in the world that we are in, I you know whether for religious reasons or not, I, I recommend a Sabbath for everybody. Yes, it is a it is a great thing to be able to say, you know, and 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 mean you know I'm not going to check my email for 25 hours, and that's that. You Do know. you feel like you miss anything? You miss out on anything doing it? Does it feel like a loss or really? No, it feels like I have to be honest. That feels like a gain. Sometimes with keeping kosher, I feel like there's some stuff that I miss out on. But but the Sabbath, an unqualified plus. Have you ever broken? Kashrut, have you ever eaten bacon? Have you ever had a cheeseburger? Uh, not intentionally. There was one point where um, I was in an airport and I got what I thought was a grilled cheese sandwich and I was like, this tastes different. Um, and then I realized what it was and then I stopped eating it. You know, but sometimes, you know, of course you see this stuff and it smells great. And it smells great. good, right. It's a- David Cross used to have a routine where he, he had possible jobs for his future career and one of them was describing uh, pork to people who keep kosher, eating oh, pork fantastic. in front of people and then describing what it tastes like. <laughs> that's fantastic. I mean, it's true. Like sometimes, you know, people sort of say, oh, I'm so, you know, they eat, they get a BLT or whatever yeah. in front of me and they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like, I don't care. You know, you do what you're going to do. Yeah, right. It's, uh, it's not disrespectful to you to no. eat. People make their own decisions. You know, I, th- I was thinking as I was reading your book, the book was published two years ago. You take a very long view. I mean, you're constantly going back a thousand years, two thousand years, and then coming forward. And so, Little changes in popular culture are not so important. And on the other hand, yeah. you know, you said a minute ago it, it's become more common to bring in an expert or somebody yeah. to just t- take the temperature of what feels comfortable and identity is ch- changing so quickly. Yeah. Also, I got the sense in the book that you almost had to add something right before it went to press about anti Semitism because there's a line in which you say, you know, it's really been on the decline, anti-Semitism. And then there's this one phrase where you say, although recent, I don't know if political events or whatever have, have may, may change that. And I thought, you must have had to change that right before it went to press. Yeah. Subsequent to that, I mean, have you noticed a shift? Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, you know, there used to be, uh, you know, I've, I've spoken about this to a lot of different audiences, and which I love doing. Um, but there used to be a line that I, I would say, and I would say this in 2008, 2010, you know, that... There has been no country in the history of the world that has been as welcoming to the Jews as the United States of America. And on the historical ground, I still believe that. Um, But it is, you know, you don't feel like you can say that with the same 100% sort of happiness and comfort after uh, Charlottesville, after Pittsburgh, Mm, after all these other things, um, as you could have, uh, you know, before. And as you say, the, the book was... You know, the, with the long lead times of books, you know, you're basically done a year in advance. Yes. But this, uh, I, I did feel, you know, that to say, look, um, a book coming out in 2017 after what some of the stuff that we had seen sort of right around the 2016 election, right after, you want to sort of keep that in mind a, li- a, a little bit. You know, one of the things that unfortunately the book suggests, and I think is that, you know, Jews and anti-Semitism are, are, you know, it's been a long history, and unfortunately, it's going to continue to be a long history. Yes. Uh, yeah. And yet, it seems like it would be impossible to ferret out the Jewishness from American culture. I mean, it, it's totally in the fabric of the, of the popular culture. It is. I, I think, you know, you you'd said a little bit ago that, um, you know, so, a lot of things don't, you know, do change and yeah. don't change. One of the biggest changes, I think, that unquestionably, uh, and I emphasize this again and again in my classes, um, is the institutional uh, and technological changes. Uh, and we have never seen something as democratizing, at least in the abstract, but I think in, in general, you know, as, as sort of the technological changes of the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it used to be that you had so much more of a tight uh, gatekeeper society for comedy as well as for any kind of culture. Whereas now, and I think this is great, you know, you have lots of different individuals from anywhere who, you know, if someone produces some video on and they put it up on YouTube and it gets 350 million hits, somebody is going to notice that. Yes. You know, and that's what happened, of course, to Rachel Bloom. Mm-hmm. Um, but, it, you know, it could happen anyway. And that, that democratization, I think, is going to lead to, and already has led to, a, a much more diverse group of, of mm-hmm. voices. And the same thing in a slightly one level up 
with, uh, you know, the, the vast number of scripted shows that are available because of multiple streaming, streaming platforms. platforms. Yeah. Yeah. It leads to more viewpoints, and at the same time, you know, one of the things that the Jews in the writer's room of uh, Sid Caesar, you know, were able to do was sneak the Jewishness into an American narrative, a larger story so that it, it was maybe a little less granular and a little less siloed and, and it was it was playing you know to the back of the house too. Yeah, I think that's right. It is an interesting question. This goes well beyond uh, my pay grade. Yeah. But <laughs> whether or not um, there is going to be such a thing as a coherent American culture anymore. Uh -huh. And so, you know, on the one hand, you don't have to sneak anything in because you can have a show like Transparent uh, now, which never would have gotten on, on the air just you know, for for <laughs> however many reasons, uh, you know that that that's on, and it can have you know an audience of I don't know, you know, of fractions yes. of of, of this. Uh, and on the other hand, it only has an audience of fractions. Nobody's gonna, you know, only X number of people are gonna watch that show, or or one of five hundred other great shows that yes. are airing. Um, whereas, as you say, you know, I mean, since Caesar already television was still expanding, and yes. so there weren't as many as many sets. But well, and in fact, you say something in the book at the end of the book that had never occurred to me, and it just is one of those examples of where technology and culture kind of collide. That uh, there was a time when nearly fifty percent of the television sets in the country were in New York, right. so your audience was New York, right? And that's what the writers of your show shows yeah. always say, and I think I mentioned this in the book that you know, once the audience got broader, yeah. They couldn't do the kind of comedy that they did anymore. No, in fact, you say once the price of television sets dropped, so did the IQ of the audience. Well, I think probably someone else. I quoted that. that. Yes, exactly. I attributed it. But yeah. uh, I certainly think that uh, executives have always been willing to underestimate the American yes. uh, intelligence, and that and that certainly is the case here, where they said, you know, this kind of comedy, people won't get it; it'll yes. go over their heads, and, and and as a result, they canceled X and they brought in Y and. You know, and why got good ratings, and it's not clear whether, as as George Costanza once says, it got good ratings because it was on. You know, I never knew why Jackie Mason's show was canceled, and it was interesting to see that not only do, are these gatekeepers and these decision makers, you know, responsible not only for successes but failures, but for, in the case of Jackie Mason, for example, he was canceled by Jews because he was too Jewish. Right. One of the th I agree. You know, uh, uh, just for the the listeners, the idea that two of the, the two most popular shows. Uh, in the first at least number of decades of television history that were canceled with the highest ratings were two Jewish shows. One was Bridget Loves Bernie and Jackie Mason's show, uh, Chicken Soup. And these were, uh, you know, any other show, it seems like, with those ratings probably would have been kept on, but it seems that there were sort of concerns about these shows being too Jewish yes. uh, by executives. And as you say, that says, that says something. I don't think... That would be the case in the same way uh, now, I don't think, but I'm not sure. Well, but they were playing by the, the rules of one singular popular narrative at the time. Yeah, and, that's right. You know, that's right. And I think, you know, this is a conversation that we are all still working through, uh, and it's happening very quickly, and there's a lot of complications and confusions about this. Just, uh, I was just, in, not in this interview that was before this, but last week I was asked about another interview. There is a casting of falsettos now in London. I don't know if you've been following this. Uh, there's, and I don't know all of the details because it's been happening, but uh, where there was a, falsetto is a, a show which is very deeply about Jews, there were no Jews involved, not only in the acting, but also sort of in the room, in the rehearsal, in the production room. There was a poster, it seems, that had a pile of shoes that were all piled together that spoke to at least some members of the, the viewing audience, sort of a, holo huh. a, a very awkward Holocaust thing. You know, and, and a lot of the Jewish theater community in London seems to have written some kind of letter saying there should have been some Jewish involvement. Yeah. And one asks, you know, is that correct or is that not correct? And when the interview came, I said, well, what about a production of, of Fiddler on the Roof that's in Japan? Mm -hmm. uh, do we say, well, they have, there have to be, maybe there are Jews in Japan, but they have to f very, have very Jewish, few. Very few, right? So do yeah. they have to have a Jewish involvement there? Yes. Do they not have to? These are all questions we're all trying to work out, and I think that, uh, um, you know, it's, it's it's still very much a process. Well, and the Jews over the years, especially when they came to America, certainly had no compunction about pretending to be 
another ethnicity. As a matter of fact, they hid inside of other ethnicities for a long time. That's a, that's absolutely right. I mean, you know, there's a long tradition uh, in the vaudeville and in, in post vaudeville early movie, you know, of Jews playing Native Americans, of Jews playing African Americans and blackface. Uh, you know, this kind of ethnic masquerade and disguise, so, and and of course of playing. Uh, Presbyterians. Yes. Um, Goyim. <laughs> Goyim. Yes. Plain Goyim. Yes. Uh, and, and, and all of these things are doing slightly different things and they're in slightly different ways, but, uh, but I, I, I think you're absolutely right that this idea of disguise is part of hmm. what the Jews are trying to do in figuring out their place in America. Can you be in disguise once you are baked into the pie, you know, once you're really in it, can you still hide out? That's a great question. I mean, my, my gut instinct is to say that what you're disguising just changes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for many decades, uh, in, and it is still something that is being worked out in different parts of popular culture, uh, you know, you had to disguise your, if, your, if your sexual orientation was, was different. Uh, you might disguise that you are, uh, in a new phrase that's beginning to, uh, to come out, neurotypical, uh, when you might be, you know, have, uh, you might be bipolar, you might something like that, right? You know, but you might want to put up a, a, a front, right? Uh, increasingly, we're, 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 we're not only, uh, uh, um, being more comfortable with taking off some masks, but we're discovering that there are other ones that nobody even talked about. Right. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's one of these interesting things with uh, television shows of, of our past, of yes. our recent past, that there's this sort of what I call this uncanny valley of wokeness, where, uh, for example, there are shows from a couple of decades ago, or more than a couple of decades before, that don't have any negative depictions of, let's say, uh, homosexuality, yeah. because there would never have been any possible discussion of them on the right. show. And then there are shows that are, 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 that are starting to have the discussion, but they have them in ways that we find very discomforting or what have yeah. you. Uh, and so we can, you know, so you have these uh, interesting sort of conversations. Yeah, so, so it's an evolution. You know, I started out by saying to you, I find, you know, some of the examples that you give sort of pre-America as being less funny. Yeah. On the other hand, I think, if I showed, like it was a great moment, I know, for my father to show me the Marx Brothers. His father loved it. He showed it to me. It was like a rite of passage. I don't know if you've had a chance to do it with your kids yet or not. but A little young, but soon. I can't wait. Um, on the other hand, I think it would be very difficult for me to explain to my daughter why Lenny Bruce is funny. I wonder if it will sound so old-fashioned and like such a different worldview. And, so, and already it does to me, but I... I loved it when I was younger, and I felt connected to another generation, just one generation away from that. Right. So maybe the the thing is that funny changes, you know. I th it absolutely does. I mean, I, I once gave a lecture on Lenny Bruce on the Ninety Second Street Y. Yeah. At the Ninety Second Street Y, and I played some bits, and they dropped like a stone. Yeah. I mean, they they died, and people were actually angry <laughs> that I played them these clips. They were like, "Why are you inflicting this upon us?" Huh. And I said to them, I said, you know, uh, I want you to listen to this, a little bit of this clip again, and I want you to listen to the screams of laughter that are in the back, because of course it was a live performance. And what we're doing here at this lecture at the 90 Seconds Why is we're not interested so much in, in laughing at the, the material, but we're interested in trying to figure out why it's funny, mm -hmm. why they laughed so hard. Yes. Um, and that was something, you know, in, 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 in a classic Columbia or in a book, that's one of these interesting things. I think that you're right, though, that in terms of our own particular aesthetic enjoyment, what we, um, what we see and what we find... Um, it, it definitely changes. Uh, you know, all the Marx Brothers movies that we love so much, um, at least from my gen my yeah. generation, are interrupted by these long stretches of musical interludes yes. that feel deadly dull. Yes. And I don't think they did back then, or they didn't in the same way. I mean, yes. these were smart people. They, they wouldn't have put them in if they just died on the, on the sure. screen. Things change, like you say. You're working on the Mel Brooks book. Do you think he still holds up today? on a popular level? I think parts of it do and parts of it don't. Yeah. I will say, though, that critics of the time also felt that Brooks was always quite uneven in yes. some of the, 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 the stuff. But, 
you know, there are other there are other parts of it that you that still have a certain kind of transgressive power. The most famous example uh, is the farting scene in Blazing Saddles, which to me is a honestly a kind of a low point. I mean, you know, I never yeah. saw him as so scatological until I read the analysis and thought, oh, right, of course, I've just chose to overlook you know, 50% of his whole point of view, which is completely <laughs> physical and gross, you know? Right. Well, and, and, you know, I think that that is the combination that makes Brooks so intriguing is this yeah. guy who really genuinely loves Dostoevsky and yes. Tolstoy and loves talking about farting. Yeah. Um, yes. And it's a, it, you know, it's a very powerful combination yes. uh, in a certain way. And I think in that way, you know, he, you know, here's this guy who looks at a kind of Western sensibility that at least in our minds is still present of these almost iconic non-body cowboys. Yes. Even despite what Clint Eastwood has done with the deconstruction of the Western, we still kind of have it. And says, they eat a lot of beans, yeah. don't they? They, they? they do, right? Are we not going to address this? Is nobody going to address is this? Is nobody yeah. going to address this? Uh, and then, you know, off it off it goes. And, and, and so I think that that scene still has power. And, yeah. you know, I think when I show this to my... Yes. You know, now I, now he's seven, but yeah. with my nine-year-old who yeah. finds this the height of the, uh, yes. or you know, it's a, um, on the other hand, there uh, there's a lot of uh, you know N-word uh, in uh -huh. Blazing Saddles, uh, and uh, you know that's something that you have to think we think about too. I yes, mean, it's uh, you know it's it's not done in a way you know all the people who say it are racist, but right. nonetheless, it's it is it, said it is said it's not just. Brooks's sensibility has changed, but the whole world view around it has changed. Yeah, I mean, and you know, and and this isn't surprising. I mean, you know, that um, we're in a very different place now and then. I mean, I think you know, but uh, and and some of the stuff. This is almost always the case with originators of bold ideas that we, you know. So, for example, the deconstructive ending at the end of the producers, yes. where it kind of goes into. Well, you know, when Brooks did it. It was genius. Who did this, right? But then, you know, so many people have deconstructed sort of the fourth wall in this yes. way that now we look like, okay, so fine. So no, he's on the So they're on stage. a set. Okay, great. It always seemed to me, um, growing up and loving Jewish comedy, I guess, that the Holocaust was like a really f fundamental aspect of what was happening. All of my favorite comics, Mel Brooks or Brooks and Reiner and Lenny Bruce and Woody Allen, had G German bits or Holocaust bits or bits about being in some way in reaction still to the Holocaust. I wonder if that still resonates in the same way with the millennial and kind of post-millennial Jewish kids. About the Holocaust. Yeah, and if that, if that even means any the same thing to them today. Yeah, I don't know whether it means the same thing yeah. to them today. That, I, that I'm yeah. not sure. But it, it certainly means something to them. Yeah. Over the last couple of decades, there's been a lot of sort of mandatory Holocaust education mm -hmm. in different kinds of uh, states. There, there is a great deal of Holocaust-related popular culture. There's young adult fiction. So, so the Holocaust still matters and, and, and means something. I will say what's interesting to me is that, you know, when Brooks, and this is one of the points I'm trying to make in this new biography, when Brooks puts out the producers, it's not just about the Jews, yeah. right? I mean, you know, you have a lot of people who fought in the war, who had relatives who died in the war, for whom, you know, the Nazis were a very visceral and real thing all through America. Uh, and, and, and they are seeing the same Nazi kick line, yes. the same kind of thing too. Um, that said, uh, you know, Hogan's Heroes had been running for a couple of years uh, at the same In fact, it premiered either the night before or the night after Get Smart, which Brooks had done. And so, you know, on the one hand, you know, you say, well, this is this thing. And on the other hand, there is a television show running, you know, every week with uh, Nazi PO POWs in a Nazi war camp where the yes. Nazis are these silly buffoons. Played, so, by, played by played, Jews. Played by Jews. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, you, uh, you, know, you kind of... Uh, come to the conclusion that everything is a little bit more complicated mm -hmm. than, than, than you think it's going to be. What is the experience for you of interacting with young students and seeing what their perception of comedy, humor, popular culture is over the years? Because you've been doing this for 20 years. I've been doing this for 20 years. And, you know, I think some of it, again, is a selection bias that students who come to the class and stay in the class after they see the syllabus are already a little bit more willing to sort of go for the ride or maybe they've, 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 they've had this kind of encounter with some of this material. I think that the students, by and large, uh, at a place like Columbia, are very 
serious, they're very smart, they're very intelligent, and sometimes uh, you know, we train them to look for meaning uh, and we're often sort of searching for meaning. And sometimes, you know, sometimes a lot of the people are saying, well, this is funny. I don't really know why, but like, you know, we're going to put this in because it's funny. And, and, you know, part of what I'm trying to do is uh, convince them to both look deeply and lighten up kind of uh, simultaneously. I mean, you say it in the book, but it's absolutely true. First of all, trying to deconstruct what makes something funny is a surefire way to remove all of the funny <laughs> from right. it. That's right. That's <laughs> right. And yet, this is your job, you know. And it, it, you know, it is interesting that you know you wrote the book on funny. Uh, to, to by, by the way, you could feel free to use that. And, um, <laughs> I will. Um, and on the other hand, you know, it, I'm sure if you were sitting in a room, and I don't know if you've had this experience of walking into a room with a bunch of comedians and say, "Hey, guess what? I'm your expert here. I'm, you know, I, I wrote the book on this." That it's two very different sensibilities. It's, it's your job to find meaning where it's not their job to find the meaning. Yeah, and I hope. I mean, I, this I really do hope that the book has, uh, and that I have a certain kind of humility in that regard. It's not, you know, I often for pre- you have not done this. But often like, are you a comedian? Do you have any interest in yes. being a comedian? No, you know, that's not what I do. That's yes. not my job. Is not to, to be professionally funny. I hope that I don't, you know, that, that I don't try and kill these things by by talking about sort of why the joke works exactly in the way it does. Yes. Instead, what I what I try mostly to do is say there's something going on out there, and the, the this comedy sort of works well to either express this or to reflect it or to to shape it. Yes. Um, but rather than saying. Okay, well, you see why this, if he had done uh, why, it wouldn't right. have been nearly as funny. If it bends, funny. it's funny. If it, if it breaks, it's not funny. Yeah. You know, you, you, I did have this moment thinking about, because I love that you print jokes, and I learned some jokes, and it was great, but, you know, not, it's not a joke book, but I, there are some examples, some I will definitely remember, but I was reminded of, you know, Lenny Bruce was arrested for indecency and he was not allowed to testify instead there's an officer who had been taking notes and then reads like a bad version of his act and he's convicted based on somebody's poor reading of his act and i thought you're in a somewhat similar position of having to explain this was funny look and it's right. like but you're not a comedian you know so you have to just present the joke kind of right bare bones you know i felt this even more profoundly in a certain way because i for my sins uh decided to read the audiobook and so one of the things about the audiobook, first, you know, you have to read the whole thing, but you also have to read every word of the jokes exactly as it is uh-huh. in the book, or at least I assumed that was the case. I actually never asked, but I assumed right. that. So you couldn't change it. Once you realized that if you were to say it, you might change a word here or there. Right. Or, you know, what we all do is we put, like I'm doing now, this kind of verbal tick, and, yes. and that helps to kind of yes. move things around, kind of. Like yes. You know, you can't do that. You just have to kind of read the words. And a lot of times, even the people who I quote the jokes from, they weren't designing it to be read out loud in this right. way. They were designed as a kind of springboard for someone to do what we all do when we tell jokes. But you can't really do that with the audiobook. Or, uh, uh, and so I just felt like I was daily. That said, the, I, I got my only sort of statuette. I got this award from the Voice Arts Award Society or something for, for reading the book in the humor category. So it's, Well, that's uh, so that's so that obviously was something. you did something. That was something. Do you, you know, you're an academic. You live in, we are in your office, surrounded by books. It was in the uh, hallowed halls of Columbia. I mean, it's really, for me, who I have, haven't been in college in, in 20 years, I guess, and, and um, to come to an institution like this, you really feel the, the weight and the power of where we are, even if we're talking about you know, fart jokes or whatever it is. <laughs> when you write a book or when you try to present this material, you know, you really are kind of speaking to two audiences. And I did feel that in your book. Did you think about that? Do you think about that tone? I do. And, you know, it is a tricky thing to to try and come for, particularly in a book where you are kind of doing a analysis. You know, I'd, the previous book that I'd written was a biography of uh, Shalom Aleichem. Of this, uh, and there, you know, you're, you know, there, there's a lot of footnotes in the back, but you're kind of telling a story. You're not, you're doing a little bit of literary criticism and analysis, but you're really telling a kind of narrative story. With this, you really aren't. You're really trying to put analytic categories on it. And, and even saying that, I can hear myself sort of, you know, sounding like a professor. And that did become difficult, particularly with material where, you know, people are expecting it to be an entertaining kind of romp, a real fun read. And, you know, you try and warn people that that's not 
what this book's purpose is, but it kind of also is, and uh, you know, and that was that was very hard to do. And I think sometimes it worked, and sometimes it didn't. But uh, you know, I think that a book like the, uh, the the Mel Brooks book, you know, is more fun in that kind of way uh, for for readers and 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 for me to write in, in a certain kind of way. Yeah, so. sure. I mean, I wonder what it would have been like. Not not to harp on it, but I wonder what it would have been like to if it had been focused on. Jewish comedy in America as opposed to Jewish comedy th- yeah. writ large, you know? It certainly would have been a different book, and, and but to be honest, it wouldn't have been the book that I wanted to write, uh-huh. right? I, I, one of the main arguments that I wanted to make was, as we talked about before, this is a very long history. Yes. And knowing something about this history in the past really does help you understand what the stakes are and what's going on in American Jewish comedy, even if... And I think this is true. Yeah. Even if many of the comedians aren't really aware of this, except in the broadest kind of way. Do you have a sense of how Jewish contemporary Jewish comedy or Jews in popular culture outside of the states? You know, you look at Sasha Baron Cohen, although he's really almost considered to, in in your thesis to be an American yeah. humorist yeah. or comedian. The way it has played out in France, in, you know, in, in areas where they're in Holland, in places where there are Jews, yeah. enough Jews to make a difference. Do you, do you get a sense of how they behave? You know, unfortunately, I don't have a very strong sense. Some of this yeah. was a, a, a relation to my own timing, yeah. uh, my own sort of limitations, and, and in some ways the presence or absence of scholarship yeah. on some of these things. Yeah. So I think it would be phenomenal to have people produce scholarship on on, on these things. And, and But it, it, to the best of my knowledge, it wasn't there. Really. I wonder if there isn't scholarship on it because it's still in the shadows. I mean, I, I, sp- yeah. I spent some time in France, for example, and I know a lot of Jews in France. And, and I find there in my limited experience, two kinds of Jews in France, either those who are still quite religious and f- have that sense of other, real otherness, yeah. or those who have no idea what it means that they're Jewish, but they know that they're Jewish and they have some kind, it's like what you describe, but like four generations f- uh-huh. further, you uh-huh. know, of like, I know I'm Jewish, but we're nothing. We never celebrated anything. We don't have, you know, we don't know what it means. Right. That, 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 I mean, it would be very interesting to see, and I think that's a very plausible thesis to me. Uh, I wish, I, you know, it is one of the things that I feel like if the book had an expanded or yes, revised right. edition, and there were people who knew this knew. stuff, you know, I, I would love to sort of incorporate some of that scholarship uh, into into a revised version of the book because that does feel less covered. This is something that's interesting to me too about what what the Jewish experience is like outside of the states when it comes to the creation of popular culture or integration in the popular culture. One of the things I found very interesting was, you know, from my other. One of my other sort yes. of shaping uh, comedic experiences was Monty Python. Yes, as for so many of them. and it was so fascinating to see how in Britain, you know, comedy was very much a top-down. You know, you went to Oxbridge and yes. you were in one of the theatrical circles in Oxbridge, and then you got a job with the light entertainment department of the BBC, you know, whatever. And that was how it worked, you know, for a long time. Now it's different, but but for for a long time, and that meant that Jews were not in the because it wasn't a bottom-up process like the United States. What did you 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 were a Rhodes Scholar, right? I was, yeah. Uh, what were you working? What were you studying? Or what was your area? In England. So I wrote my doctoral thesis yes. while I was there, and I wrote on the way, it was kind of comedy, it was the way in which um, Jewish writers in the 18th and 19th century used biblical and rabbinic texts in their work. And they used them often as satirical kind of yes. jabs, or, but to make kind of polemical points, they, you know, uh, very frequently. Um, against, they were enlightenment figures, and so they would say, well, Hasidim say this, but really the Bible says this, and, you know, that, yes. that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, it was the, actually the development of a certain kind of modern Jewish comedy. Yes. Um, and not surprisingly, it, 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 it borrowed from both contemporary European comedy, but it also borrowed from internal Jewish traditions, uh, the Purim tradition, the Hasidic tradition, and things like that. What was it like for you to be doing that work in England? Was Is there a history of scholarship in England of this work? There's some. I mean, there there was some. I, you know, to do your doctorate in England, you largely, or at least at Oxford, I should say, you are largely kind of left alone to produce 
a book. And if they like the book, then they give you the doctorate. And if they don't, then they don't. Um, so I basically spent a lot of my time in libraries or, yeah. uh, you know, just writing. But was there a sense of being, uh, you know, I'm just curious to have, yeah. be, this is, you know, particularly because of eventually you end up writing about Jewish comedy and then Mel Brooks, but, but you had this formation in England, although as I hear you saying, you actually had a formation in a kind of a empty library where you, could, you could, <laughs> kind of could have been anywhere. But, but I mean, d did you get a sense of otherness or different perspective being outside of the States and thinking about this stuff? The things that, that I did were, were very frequently outside of a lot of the general conversations anyway. Yeah. So it didn't really feel that much different. Yeah. Uh, I will say that, you know, you did feel that Oxford, not surprisingly, was a much less Jewish place yeah. than, <laughs> Columbia than Columbia or Harvard, or, or Harvard yeah. where I'd been before that. You know, even, you know, I mean, there was one point where I remember, I was just telling my wife about this, that it was Easter weekend and I almost starved because everything was closed. And in New York or in Boston, where you say, well, you know, some things are closed, yeah. sure, but not every, but really everything was closed and I couldn't find anything to eat. You have, like many, you know, experienced most of your childhood and adult life in an, in a world in which there are Jews. A hundred percent. So if nothing else, just be realizing that there are fewer Jews is a, is a thing. Yeah. It's funny to sort of accentuate your point by yeah. quoting Philip Roth. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> Philip Roth, I think in the, it's in the counter life, right? I mean, he has this chapter where he, he goes to England and it's called Christendom. Yeah. And, you know, there was a way in which, especially, and remember, this is uh, almost a quarter of a century ago. Yes. Uh, so even more then than now. Yeah. Uh, and in Oxford more than in London. Yeah. Uh, in London, I'm sure I would have found a place to eat. But in, in, in Oxford, you know, it really felt like Christendom. Um, and it was not, particularly hostile it was not uh, you know uh, but but it, it it was definitely not jewish did you ex have to explain that you were kosher did you have to did you go out of your way to explain that you were jewish was it obvious well i, mean, I was i was wearing a kippah uh -huh. then so it, it was it was obvious yeah. um but one of the again one of the things about sort of these things just being how it is for me was uh, you know when it came up it came up and it was fine and when it didn't it wasn't you know there was not a a sense where people said Oh, what is this Yom Kippur? And you know, but you have right. to be here right at this particular time or right. something like that. I don't think that ever came up. If you were going to write your book again today, what would you? What have you learned since then, or what? What? What would you do? What would you add? That's a good question. The questions that that, that have come up the most frequently in talking about mm. it to audiences have been about more Israeli humor, and about Israel, which I talk about some, but I could certainly talk about more, and B, even dig a little bit deeper into when Israeli humor is Jewish humor and when it's not. Um, well, that, and that's a stand-in for a larger question, not only about humor, but about identity in, in general and- Absolutely. And point of view and, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and to the extent to, to spend more time at least addressing this question of what one would call Mizrahi humor, you know, a lot of what I talk about is really uh, Eastern European Jewish humor kind of in its successors. And, you know, that's that was a large degree of the audience. But there was more to say on that and, and more to say about how I hope that there'll be more scholarship about that. There is, there, there is not. And that actually speaks to a certain kind of imbalance in the American Academy that's producing a lot of this knowledge, mm -hmm. too. Which I think, to be fair, a lot of Jewish studies now in the, in, in the last even couple of years are trying to address aggressively through hiring and things like that. Is it beneficial to take your work out into the public and see what, what comes back to you, to feel that, that feedback for better or for worse? I love it. I love, I, I, you know, it, it helps me be a better thinker, a better writer, a better person. A better person. Certainly a better <laughs> thinker and a better writer. Um, but I'll give you an even an example from the previous uh, book, this Worlds of Shalom Aleichem, yeah. where I was very like that, uh, uh, you know, it got a very substantial review in yeah. the um, in the Atlantic. And one, uh, and the writer, who was largely speaking very complimentary, said, you know, he doesn't really talk about Shalom Aleichem's family. He talks all about his work, about his life, about the current stuff. And, you know, I was like, okay. And then I would go and I would talk about it to audiences and everyone always asked about the family. And I, it turned out, I didn't really care about his family. I cared about his, but that was wrong. That was, that was, was my, wrong of you to do. it yeah. was wrong, but it was my bias. But this book isn't, the, the books aren't just about you. The books are about sort of you and the audience. Right. Um, and thinking about that with Mel Brooks' book, I'm going to spend 
not that much time, but more time on his family. Of course, it helps that he's married to Anne Bancroft, and that's part of the story. Yes. Right? But uh, more time on his family than I probably would have, because ultimately, um, this is something that's part of a conversation of what the audience wants to have about about these topics. You know, like the Times was uh, was mixed about your book. Yeah, that's right. And and they particularly didn't like the writer did not like the conceit of moving back and forth in time. You know, D despite your you know argument at the beginning of the book and in the beginning of our conversation about saying, but the but the only al alternative I saw was to make you wait two hundred pages before we got to the stuff that you really care about. Yeah, or take it out of sequence or whatever. Yeah, and, but I thought about that. But what a what a what a tricky thing. I mean, you know, you, you write a book, obviously criticism is what it is. You engage in a certain form of cultural criticism as well, or, yeah. and, 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 or of criticism. And yet, uh, see, I wonder if maybe when, when uh, you get the, the blowback about the family in the Atlantic, if people in the audience have read the review before they go in, and talk to you. Maybe, although I, it didn't seem, for right. the Atlantic, it didn't yeah. seem that way. Uh, you know, I will say I was kind of annoyed that of all of the many, many, many good reviews of the book, the one sort of bad review or mixed review appeared in the Times, but, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. I think that this was something that, uh, as, you, as you're suggesting very generously, was something that we thought about. Uh, when I say we, I mean my, my agent, the editor, it was, we thought, the best solution. Yeah. Most of the people who paid attention and thought about the book did not object to it. Right. This guy did. If I had done it chronologically, you know, it's a counterfactual universe, and maybe half of them would say, well, why doesn't he spend any time? You know, he sure. spent so long. So, well, what, what I notice is that, for yeah. example, in, in the case of the Times, that's a criticism that basically you say, well, well, look, I thought about this, you know, and this was a strategy that we developed as opposed to with Shalom Aleichem where you're saying, you know what, you're right. Yeah. My prejudice was I wasn't interested in that. And so yeah. I didn't, I, I overlooked it. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's one of the things that you try and do with student reviews, you know, as you say, you know, you look at them, you take them seriously and say, you know, is this something that I recognize? Is yeah. this something that I can learn from? Or is it not? And sometimes, uh, you know, it is. And then you really say, okay, well, how can I work to change this and make my life better? And sometimes, you know, you say, well, they're not right. Yeah. Um, they they have misunderstood something. You know, that happens too. Um, or we've tried it. You've, you've tried this way or that way, and you've decided to go this other way. Uh, and, uh, you know, not everybody is going to be happy all the time. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, you know, uh, there is that old cliche, which, it, but there is truth in it, that, you know, you just can't please everybody. Sure. Uh, and that's... That's okay. You know, I've been doing this long enough and written enough books yes. that, uh, uh, you know, you're just not going to be happy. I just, as I say, I wish that one had been, you know, in right. some other journal right. and all of the other ones that and liked it. Any been, other one would have been in. Any other one would have been the time. Well, you know, again, what are you going to do? You do, you, do, you have a, do you have an audience in mind? Do you imagine an audience? Do you, do you have like a target reader? When you were writing this, were you yeah. thinking, I really wish or hope that so-and-so reads this or this kind of person reads it? You know, it's a great question. Not... Not that explicitly. I think some people say, you know, oh, my mom yeah. or oh, my, uh, my wife. Um, for me, it is people who say, you know, I really love this stuff. I want to think more about it. But that's, that, that differs from book to book a little bit, yeah. but that's mostly what it is, is just someone saying, you know, I just, I, I care about these things and I don't know that much about it. Or even, I do know a lot about parts of it, but I don't know a lot about all of these other things. And, you know, even with this book, this American comic, I'm also writing this book about American comic books that I'm, I'm doing next is that I, I think I even say explicitly in the draft, like, you know, I think a lot of people are going to know a lot about some of this. Yeah. But hopefully you'll come away with stuff you didn't know. And, uh, you know, that'll make the ride worthwhile. Uh, and that's, uh, that's all that I kind of can hope for. Yeah, I think that, Pete, you know, when it comes to th things like humor, comic books, comedy, Whatever you you know, there, there's a there's a kind of reader who really just wants a kind of catalog of the funniest moments of Jewish humor and you know and, yeah. and call it a day you know yeah um, and and obviously this book is not that yeah I mean I even say as as you know of course in the book I say you want a joke book you buy a joke book yes. like that's that's great and yes. there's a market for joke and, and people should buy joke books they're they're wonderful I have joke books but that's not what this book is yes uh, and. That's okay, you know, it's, um, different books are for different people. But I think ultimately, you know, what happens is, and, and I think a lot of people now are increasingly moving in this direction. The academy is saying, you know, 
we're working on things, whether they be you know comic books or or, or Jewish comedy or civil rights yeah. history, or, that people are really interested in. They're yeah. genuinely interested in, and there's no reason not to write a, a you know a, a a substantive and intellectually meaningful and deep and complicated version of of, of your research that can't also be understood mm -hmm. uh, by a broad audience. Right. Who are hungering for it? You know, who want to read these things? Uh, and and I, I think it's great that a lot of my colleagues are increasingly engaging in this kind of public-facing scholarship. Yes, you know, as I said before, I'm a big fan of peer review, however you call that, right? Um, and and I think that it's you know it, it, it's great to to have other experts sort of look at your work, make sure you're doing it yes. right. You know, but. Well, it's interesting because from a point of view of comedy, I mean, we are all peers in the sense that we all share some common love of something. We, we're not experts, but we we, sh we share an appreciation of it. That's absolutely right. And I, I, I mean, yes, you know, we're at Columbia University, but I don't believe that the only people who are experts uh, on these things and, you know, are, are people who... Uh, you know, have positions in the university. In fact, one of my, you know, one of my, you can't see on the podcast, but I'm making air quotes, peer reviewers, um, was an old friend of mine, Jason Zinneman, who's blurbs, it, who is the comedy columnist for the New York Times. Uh -huh. Clearly, this man knows a tremendous amount about comedy, yeah. and I, I took what he had to say about this, you know, very seriously. And, uh, you know, you know, did I miss something? Did I misrepresent something? Yes. Did I and of course, you know, you, you want you'd, you'd vastly prefer to know this uh, in advance. But it's also, I mean, I don't think that there is or should be ego in this. Nobody knows everything. Nobody people get things wrong. You should just, uh, you know, if, if if somebody who knows something that you don't is able to correct you, then great. Yes. You know, fantastic. So that's uh, that's always been my position on these things. Well, Jeremy Dauber, thank you for writing it down so you could figure out what you thought about it and uh, share it with us. Thank you so much. This is a real pleasure. Yeah, for me too. There he was, Jeremy Dauber, unpacking the questions of history, humor, fart jokes, and accidentally eating pork. I'll be back again soon with another deep diving conversation. Until then, I'll talk to you soon.